500 years ago, the first Christian baptism in the Philippines happened in Cebu back in April 14, 1521. But did our ancestors really, truly, and quickly converted to Christianity out of religious devotion? Or did they only participate in this Catholic rites out of curiosity? Let's learn more. Mabuhay or in Kapampangan, Luwid Kayu. It's me Kirby Aralio, your friendly Pinoy historian. And if you are new to my channel, in this channel, I make videos about our people's history, our people's culture, and everything in between. So don't forget to like, share this video, comment down below, and please subscribe. So for today's video, it's a raw vlog. Which means there's no notes, no outlines, just off the top of my head. Um, sharing what I know and what I think about certain topics. And today's topic is about the first known, the first recorded, the first baptism, Christian baptism in the Philippines that happened in Cebu 500 years ago this week. So officially it marks 500 years of Christianity in the islands of the Philippines. But before we continue with our topic, just in case you missed it, my new books, Know Our Roots Number 1 about Ando, Slavery, and the Revolt of the Lacans, and my new coloring book, Color Our Roots, The Ancient Luzones are now available online. So check out the links below and get your copies today. And also, today's topic will also be included and expanded on in my upcoming book, Know Our Roots Number 3, What They Never Told You About the Discovery of the Philippines. So please keep an eye out for that, along with the second Know Our Roots and the second Color Our Roots about the fierce women of ancient Southeast Asia coming very soon. So please keep an eye out. Daghang salamat! Now back to our topic! So 500 years ago, on April 14, 1521, the first recorded Christian baptism in what is now the Philippines was held in Cebu. So hundreds of the local population, hundreds of the local people, were baptized along with the king and the queen of Cebu, or Cebu, Raja Humabon and Hara Humamay, also known as Hara Mihan or Reina Juana of Cebu. And this baptism did not happen in one sitting. It was actually a long one. They started in the morning, so Raja Humabon along with his men were baptized baptized in the morning. And according to the Spanish accounts, he took on the Christian name Carlos after the King of Spain, King Charles II of Spain, who was also known as the Emperor Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire. And it was also said that Raja Colombo of Mazawa adopted the Christian name Juan or John. You know, before I forget, um, Raja Colombo of Mazawa and Raja Siago of Butuan were actually the cousins of Raja Humabon of Cebu. And so following this, hundreds more were baptized. And then the Spaniards took a break. They took a lunch break, which was actually around 2 p.m. And then they continued on baptizing more people. And this included Hara Humamai and her court ladies, who were actually baptized in the evening and not in the same morning as her husband. And Hara Humamai was given the Christian name Juana after the mother of King Charles. Queen Joanna of Castile and Aragon. So overall, it was said that there was about 500 to 1,000 converts. But then again, we can't really know for sure. We can't be 100% sure how many because the accounts actually vary in details. But contrary to our popular imagination, to how we picture this event, to how we imagine what happened, Hara Humamai was not kneeling in submission during their baptism nor in any part of this historic encounter between Magellan's expedition and our pre-colonial Visayan ancestors. So in reality, Hara Humamai was actually sitting on an elevated silk cushion. And you know, this is actually typical for the royalties of Southeast Asia. It was a very dignified position befitting the Queen of Subu. Here is a beautiful illustration and a more accurate picture of this historic event and this was made by Shari Villaver of Cebu. Di ba And actually, Antonio Pigafetta himself, the official chronicler, the person who wrote the journal of this historic expedition, he never said that she was kneeling. He actually said in his account, he indicated that she was sitting on a cushion, which again is the traditional thrones for the royalties of Southeast Asia, or actually even throughout Asia. The kings and queens sat on an elevated cushions. And you know, it, it was a dignified seat. It was a dignified position given her status as the queen of Subbu. You know, she was not kneeling. 
And you know, if anything, it would be the Europeans who would be kneeling or bowing to show their respect to the rulers of the Visayas, to the rulers of Southeast Asia during this time. And you know, not the other way around. In fact, the survival of the Europeans, especially the Magellan expedition, hinges on their friendship with the rulers of the Visayas and Southeast Asia. You know, they would not survive without the hospitality and the humanity that was shown by our ancestors. So when they first came to the Visayas, you know, when they supposedly discovered the Philippines, they were already starving for months. They were malnourished until the Visayans fed them, until the Visayans provided them with food and shelter. And you know, actually, the same thing happened months later when they were in the Sulu Sea, when again, they ran out of supplies. They ran out of food and ran out of provisions. And this time, they owed their survival to the generosity of Sultan Bolkiah of Brunei, who was the husband of Putri Lele Mejinai of Sulu. During this time, it was actually our ancestors who were in the positions of power above the Europeans, not the other way around, as is often depicted in numerous paintings and illustrations from books to museums. And you know, we can't really blame the artists behind these masterpieces. We can't really blame the maestros. You know, because this, this is how we were taught for centuries. You know, this colonial miseducation of our people, you know, really belittled the way we see, the way we understood our own ancestors, the way we understood our own past. You know, the centuries of colonial miseducation from the Spaniards all the way to the Americans, you know, this really degraded the way we see, the way we imagine, the way we picture our own roots, the way we picture our own ancestors. But as you all know well hopefully as you all know from watching my videos these really are really far from reality our ancestors were not savages they were not barbaric um ignorant savages that is often depicted in the mainstream narrative there's still a lot to learn unlearn and, and relearn about our own roots, about our own people's colorful and really rich history. We actually have a lot of reimagining to do, to give justice and to really get to know and paint a better picture and a more accurate picture of our ancestors. So shout out to all the artists today who are really working hard to you know, create new masterpieces that really depicts our ancestors in a more accurate light. So maraming maraming salamat, shout out sa inyo. Uh, for example, Derek Makutai. Maestro Derek has been doing great in depicting our ancestors in a more accurate and historically accurate picture. And also shout out to all the younger generation who are working hard to decolonize our understanding of our own roots. You know, it's really important for us to see them, to see our ancestors as they were. They were civilized and not ignorant. They're not barbaric. They're not savages before Christianity, before colonialism. You know, they had sophisticated civilizations. They were not, again, they were not barbaric or savages. But anyways, you know, today, Haro Mamai is actually, you know, closely associated with the advent of Christianity in the Philippines and the beloved icon, the beloved image of Santo Nino de Cebu. I mean, there's a whole industry revolving around the Sinulog Festival that celebrates this event in our history, that celebrates this part of our own culture back in the motherland and also in the diaspora. And you know, this, this Santo Nino de Cebu is known as the oldest surviving Christian relic, the oldest surviving Catholic icon in the Philippines. And it is believed that when the Spaniards, led by um, Miguel Lopez de Legazpi, when they returned in the Visayas in 1565, more than four decades, almost 50 years since Magellan's expedition, they found the same exact Santo Nino that Magellan gifted to the Queen of Cebu. And today, this Santo Nino is enshrined within the Basilica Menore de Santo Nino de Cebu in Cebu City. And you know, it became one of the most well-known icons of our modern-day Filipino Christian Christian culture. It became the basis of a lot of the Santo Nino images we see in the Philippines and in the Filipino diaspora around the world today. You know, the beloved symbol of 500 years of Christianity in the Philippines, the baby Jesus, the Santo Nino de Cebu. But did our ancestors truly, really embrace Christianity out of religious devotion back in 1521? Or did they only participate in this Catholic rites, in this mass and baptism out of curiosity? You know, because this, this narrative of our ancestors quickly converting, easily submitting themselves to Christianity within just days of meeting the Europeans, you know, it's kind of biased towards, you know, bias in favor of colonialism. And you know, the truth is, we can really never know for sure what motivated the pre-colonial Visayans to convert. Actually, we don't really even know for sure, One, we're not 100% sure if they really converted. Or at least for how long were they Christians? You 
you know, after the Europeans left. You know, because many may not even know. Even this friendship between the Raja Humabon and the Spaniards, the Spanish expedition, you know, this quickly disintegrated. The Europeans had to leave Cebu in a hurry. So after they were defeated by Lapu-Lapu's forces in the Battle of Mactan on April 27, 1521, you know, as a result, Humabon and his warriors plotted to kill the remaining Spanish conquistadors. They hosted a feast with the Europeans, with the Spaniards, but behind the scenes, they actually planned, they actually plotted to kill all the Spaniards, all the Europeans. And among those who were killed were Duarte Barbosa and Joao Serrao. And you know, this happened just a few days, just a few days after the Battle of Mactan, where Magellan himself died. And you know, if we study what we know happened within the context of our ancestors' own understanding of geopolitics, of their own understanding of the universe, of their cosmology, their supposed conversion to Christianity in 1521, you know, it was really a political step, more political than a religious one. You know, the Europeans tried to bribe our ancestors, and perhaps they saw some advantages of being allied with the Spaniards, and perhaps they took advantage of that. And again, the pre-colonial geopolitics of Southeast Asia, as I've mentioned in many of my videos, you know, this was far different than the nation-state system that we are familiar with today. It was more complex with overlapping alliances, overlapping sovereignties, overlapping borders, and you know, complicated but highly functioning network of kingdoms, of empires, and smaller states. It was fluid. It was multicultural. It was multi-ethnic. It was multi-fate. So let's see, how can I explain this better? Um, you know, in our modern day context, um, during this time in 1521 and the 1500s, the Europeans during this time in Southeast Asia, you know, they were like, they were like, you know, in PBA, in the Philippine Basketball Association, they were like the imports that joined the team. You know, they were the new players that were welcomed in this game of geography and politics, of power in Southeast Asia. But for now, let's go back to the Santo Nino de Cebu. You know, if we look beyond the Western lands, if we look beyond the colonial narrative and dig deeper into our ancestors' cosmology and their own understanding of the universe, the Santo Nino did not replace the pre-colonial Anitos or the Diwatas, the deities, the gods and goddesses of our ancestors. But instead, the Santo Nino was actually welcomed and included as a new deity in the local pantheon of deities. And this is similar with the Hindu Buddha this traditions across Southeast Asia. We know where there is a synchrony of different beliefs. It was a vast collection of deities of both indigenous origins and of foreign influence. And anyone, anyone was free to choose what they believe in. So in short, they saw the Santo Nino as a new deity. You know, one among their collection of deities in the Visayas. In fact, actually, this is why we have a deity named Santo Nilio in the ancient pantheon of the Visayas. And Santo Nino was revered as the god of graces. The Santo Nino, you know, the baby Jesus that Magellan brought and gave as a gift to the Queen of Cebu, Harahumamai, you know, this Santo Nino evolved and took on an indigenized form. You know, the little baby Jesus, the holy child in the Christian faith, this became part of this family of the ancient gods and goddesses of the Visayans. And this tradition of adopting new gods in the pantheon of the deities in Southeast Asia is really not new to Southeast Asia. You know, for example, when Buddhism was introduced in the region, many accepted it as among the pantheon of deities in the region. You know, in other words, the Buddha became part of this vast collection of deities of gods and goddesses in Southeast Asia of both Hindu origins and of course our own indigenous ones. Which is why, you know, if you study Southeast Asian history, culture, and spirituality, you'd actually see a lot of interwoven beliefs and traditions from both Hinduism from Buddhism and our own diverse indigenous roots. And just like the political systems of our ancestors, religion, it was not rigid like how religion is understood in the West and the Middle East during this time. It's not as rigid as we see religion today. You know, in fact, multi-faith families, these were pretty common throughout the region, throughout Southeast Asia. You know, so there was actually, there's actually a lot of relatively peaceful coexistence between the different religions in Southeast Asia. 
Asia. You know, this religious conflict in Southeast Asia really only escalated after colonialism. Spirituality and religion in Southeast Asia, not just in the Philippines but across Southeast Asia, it was not black and white. It was very vivid, very colorful, with lots of shades, with lots of gradients in between. Or as how the, the late Francis M, the great Francis Magalona would put it from his song, it was a kaleidoscope world, you know? Every color, every hue is represented by me and you. Take a slide in the slope. Take a look in the kaleidoscope. Spin around, make it twirl in this kaleidoscope world. <laughs> I hope I sang that one right. Um, Apologies if I didn't. Let me know in the comments. Um, and shout out to the great Francis M. Southeast Asia back then, the Philippines and the rest of Southeast Asia back then, it was a kaleidoscope world. It was very vivid, very colorful, very lively. It was, you know, it was beautiful. As I've seen it over the years, I understand that many people would equate certain religions with extreme prejudice. A lot of it is really based on hatred. You know, feeding hatred and not taking the time or the effort to really get to know the other side. And just basing your hatred on small little snippets of what you, you know, what you think you know. But let's face it, the truth is, you know, one's religion is not necessarily the culprit. You know, it's not necessary. One's religion is not necessarily the root of one's evil. I mean, it is what we do with our religion that matters. It's what we do with it, not the label. You know, I don't think any religion is inherently or naturally bad. It's really what we do with it, not about the labels. You know, it's really being fanatics, being the extremist that, that really makes any religion bad. You know, it's one's actions, it's our actions that could turn something into good or something into evil. You know, when religion is abused and used as weapons, and it's any religion could be be used and abused as weapons, you know, to oppress, to exploit, and to unleash violence upon the others. You know, that's when we end up with senseless violence in our societies. That's how we end up with exploitation, with oppressions, with injustices in our societies. That's how we end up with genocide. It's the actions we take, not the labels. It's what we do with it. So yes, there's really a lot that we can learn from our own ancestors, how they saw the world, how they saw the universe. How how they saw spirituality, how they saw religion, how they saw society. I'm not saying that they're perfect, but we really can learn a lot from them. And like I've mentioned to many of you, to many of my lectures, many of my students, knowing our roots doesn't simply mean this nostalgic longing for the glitz and the glamour of the past while ignoring the conditions of the present. You know, but really it means facing the realities of today, you know, being awakened armed and empowered by the wisdom and the weapons of our ancestors. You know, it means staying rooted in our people's history while at the same time taking actions to address the current issues, the current crises that our people are facing today. That's what knowing our roots really means. That's what knowing history really means. You know, it's really not just about throwbacks. It's also about moving forward. And, and I'll leave it at that. But of course, before we go, today's shout out goes to Ali Puji Setiawan from Indonesia, Lin Tran from Vietnam, Alexius Dangat from Malaysia, Sara Chin from Cambodia. And this is not a sponsored video, but shout out to the Daily Malong in the US. Dakal pung salamat, dakala salamat for your gift. And special shout out to Shari Villaver of Cebu. Daghang salamat for your beautiful art, for all your work in accurately depicting our ancestors. Daghang salamat. And special shout out then to the Karakoa Productions. Daghang salamat for all your work, your all your beautiful work in, in teaching us, in educating us about the pre-colonial Visayan culture and history. So daghang salamat, terima kasih, orkan, come on, agyaman. Thank you. Thank you for all your love and support. And don't forget to comment below if you want a shout out in future videos. And that is it for me today. If you like this video, learn a thing or two, don't forget to like, share this video, comment down below, and please subscribe. And special thanks, special shout out to all my patrons over at Patreon. Thank you for all your love and support in helping me make more videos like this. And for those who want to help me make more videos like this, show your support and please, please be my patron or get a copy of any of my books or 
coloring books, or any of the merch link down below. And again, today's topic will also be included and expanded upon in my upcoming book, No Our Roots Number 3, What They Never Told You About the Discovery of the Philippines. So please keep an eye out for that and No Our Roots Number 2 and Color Our Roots Number 2 about the fierce women of ancient Southeast Asia, where I also included Hara Humamai of Subu, the Queen of Cebu. So stay tuned and don't miss out. These are coming very soon. Daghang salamat. Maraming maraming salamat po. Dakal pong salamat. Agyamanak terimakasi. See you next time or in Tagalog Kita Kids. And kapabangan, Miki Ticks!